Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Bazubitz, President and CEO of the Royal, one of Canada's leading mental health and research centres. My team and I are very pleased to partner with Rogers TV Ottawa for another special edition of Conversations at the Royal during Mental Health Week. As a care, research and teaching hospital, our goal is to help bring the latest information on treatments and research findings in mental health to you, the public. At the Royal, we provide care to individuals from 16 years of age to the elderly who experience important mental health and addiction challenges. We also serve veterans and active members of the Canadian Forces and the RCMP for an operational stress injury while serving our country on humanitarian missions. Every client at the Royal receives best in class care informed by cutting edge research to live their best life. This week, you will hear from many of our amazing clinicians who are passionate about the care they provide and the research that will lead to novel treatments and new discoveries in mental health and addictions care. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Guillaume Tremblay, the lead nurse practitioner for the Royal who delivers primary care services to a range of clients at the Brockville and the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centers. Many clients not only experience mental health issues, but they have significant health challenges. Having a nurse practitioner like Guillaume available can help clients at the Royal on site. Guillaume is a big proponent of health promotion and mental health prevention. In fact, his passion in the neuroscience of well being, along with his colleagues, kickstarted a mental hygiene 30 day challenge for staff at the Royal and members of the public. They've shown why it's important for the brain to have regular maintenance for optimal functioning, just like what we know is critical in physical health. Guillaume calls it mental hygiene, and I can tell you that it was a hit with staff and members of the public. Our Facebook page was full of insightful activities and sharing of tips that people shared that supported their mental health and well-being. I invite you to hear Guillaume talk about the happy brain and why it can support everyone's mental health and well-being. Thank you for joining us for Conversations at the Royal. Good day, everyone. Very happy to be here and to have the opportunity to speak about mental hygiene. I want to thank Rogers TV for the invitation and the opportunity to speak about something that I believe is, is very important for the health of the general population. And, you know, we're in a interesting times in terms of the, the civilization, what we're going through, and a lot of it is taxing our mental health. And so we want to use every strategy possible to continue to support the mental health of individuals and the general population at the same time. And the content that we're going to share here today uh, is all about that. It's all about what can we do on a, to fundamentally improve our mental well-being and reduce uh, our suffering. Now, I just want to be clear about some terminology. When I say suffering, I use it in a general way, meaning, you know, a little bit of anxiety is a form of suffering. Having the worst day of your life with something traumatic happen is suffering. So there's different variations, different spectrums of suffering. But I kind of use the same word to apply to a little bit of suffering to a lot of suffering. And so again, the question that we're here to explore today together is how do we fundamentally reduce our suffering and increase our well-being, our mental well-being, uh, and, and able to build some psychological resilience and navigate the many challenges that we all face today, and, and so to try to move through life in a, in a healthy and positive way. So we're going to talk about a lot about mental hygiene. That's the main key item. The presentation here is called the happy brain. And really what we want to talk about is the concept of mental hygiene, what it is, why it's important, and, and how we can apply it to our day-to-day -day lives. So we'll move to the next slide. So we want to talk about mental hygiene. Hygiene is a very useful word. 
we use it for a lot of terms, dental hygiene, physical hygiene, hand hygiene, sleep hygiene. Hygiene is basically means practices or conditions that are conducive to health. So if you brush your teeth every day, you create conditions and you have practices, brushing your teeth is a practice that is conducive to oral health. So practices or conditions conducive to health. That is essentially what the word hygiene means. And so here, if we go to the next slide again, we'll see that there are a lot of public health recommendations that already exist from a hygienic perspective. The Canadian Dental Association tells us we have to brush our teeth twice a day. The sleep, uh, Canadian Sleep Society says to us we should aim for about six, seven to eight hours of sleep per night and avoid alcohol, nicotine, um, and caffeine before bed to try to get a good night's rest. Um, the World Health Organizations, along with Health Canada and the CDC, say we should target about 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week. So there are clear recommendations given to the public uh, for different aspects of our health. But there's nothing really equivalent for our mental health. There's no specific sort of minimum standard that we should all strive for that has been made explicit and very clear to the public by public health organizations. And this is what we uh, are trying to look at and trying to tackle and trying to create the goal of establishing agreed upon minimum level sort of day-to-day -day practices that we should all target for in order to support our mental health. So that's why, and we're calling it mental hygiene. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about that word and repeat it over and over again through different approaches. And, and I hope you, you tag along and, and let me guide you through what my thought process is about it. So a couple of things, we're going to do a, go into a little bit of neurocognitive science in the next slide here. So there are networks of the brain that are kind of pretty simple to understand, but very useful in our understanding. So what we're going to talk about a good amount here is the default mode network and the task positive network. Okay, so the brain is a very, obviously a very complex, very amazing organ with a ton and ton of complexity to it. So these, these networks that we show with these little graphs and pictures are obviously a, a simplified model. But for the sake of this conversation and where we're getting at, um, it certainly serves the purpose of, of giving us a, a good idea of, of what we're talking about here, okay? So in the next slide here, we're gonna talk about the default mode network. So for so, some of you who like the sciencey stuff, um, the, it's two main hubs that communicate back and forth in the middle of the brain, okay? The medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex, you can see in the little, uh, picture of the brain, they, they're in the midbrain area, and they, se they send signals back and forth. And this is called the default mode network, which has been studied quite extensively in cognitive neuroscience for about 20 years or so. And my hope is that the public, the general public, becomes quite familiar with this terminology, and it doesn't become a novel thing. So right now it is a bit novel for me to bring this up to you, but I hope that with time people understand what the default mode network is, just like we understand what dental plaque is and, and stuff, stuff like that. So next slide here is, why is it important to know about the default mode network? Because it's associated to cognitive patterns or thought patterns that we all experience, okay? This is a universal thing. This is something every single one of us to some degree will experience in our day-to-day -day lives. So for example, things like rumination, okay? Rumination is a terminology used in psychology, meaning this sort of circular, repetitive thinking about something that usually is negative. And we usually do that only with negative things. You know, for example, a beautiful sunset that captures our attention. Wow, look at that you know, pink sky or something. We don't go ahead over and over in our head and say, look at that pink sky, look at the pink sky, look at the pink sky. We usually do this for those negative things. So like if I have a little spat with my spouse, I might say, I should have said this to her, I should have said this, or she kept saying this, she kept, you know. So we can have this rumination, we ruminate about, usually about negative things. You know, the little picture there shows the, all the hypothetical arguments I've won in the shower. You know, I've, I don't know if any of you have experienced that before, um, but I win a lot of hypothetical arguments in the shower. So, <laughs> excuse me. Also is something called the self-referential internal narrative. So that's kind of a fancy way of saying, talking to yourself about yourself in your head all day long. Something again, very common, 
uh, that we all do. Mind wandering. So, you know, somebody's talking to you and you're somewhere else, or you're trying to do something and your mind's drifting off somewhere else. We all tend to mind wander. Or non-practical thoughts about the future and the past. Okay, something, again, we're going to distinguish some forms of thinking. I'm not here to, to say that all thinking is bad. We're just saying that the, the, the practical, useful thinking that helps us get organized, get things done, that's fine. And we're going to, you know, leave that alone. And that's very useful and incredibly helpful. But you might observe in your life that a lot of your thinking is not practical. So sometimes thinking about the past can be useful. Oh, this happened last time I did this, therefore I won't do that again. Very practical. Or I'm going to plan out my vacation by scheduling it at this time and plug it into the calendar here so that I don't forget in a couple of days, so on and so forth. So your thoughts about the future are practical and you're just orientating yourself. But then there's all the other stuff, you know, regretting the past or anticipating the future or kind of living in this sort of imaginary future and past world that, you know, doesn't really exist and just tends to make us more anxious or not enjoy our day-to-day -day lives as much. Um, more funny ways to talk about it is basically the blah, 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 or the hamster wheel running nonstop in her head or the monkey mind. Lots of different ways we can talk about uh, this cognitive pattern. And so all these sort of ways of describing this typical cognitive pattern, this sort of this excessive thinking is associated with activity of the default mode network. And this is why I really want people to grasp the importance of understanding the, me the mechanics of the default mode network and its implication for a day-to-day -day lives. So we'll move on to the next slide. So again, why, you know, what do we know about the default mode network? And, and its relationship to mental health. Well, uh, as shown here, and there's quite a few studies about this, that when the default mode network is hyper-connected or very, very active, lots of activity happening, lots of, let's say, rumination, lots of excessive thinking, there's a tendency to be more vulnerable to mental health issues. So again, hyper-connectivity of this network has been associated with major depression. Uh, anxiety disorders, various other mental health issues. So it, it, is, it does have significant implications in terms of our well-being, in terms of living life with uh, a minimum of mental health challenges. And so this is a little bit of where we're slowly getting at here in terms of mental hygiene and why it's so important for every single human being on this planet. <laughs> so uh, next slide again. Now, in terms of the opposite sort of direction, there's also quite a bit of data on that as well. So the default mode network and happiness. Now we know from quite a few studies, which is really interesting, they use what we call functional magnetic resonance imaging studies. So kind of like an MRI machine, except a live sort of image, a live study. Um, and they can see the uh, activity of the brain in different networks. And that's getting better and better. And it's not like the science is done and there's more to find out but there's been some very interesting findings uh, over the last two decades. So one thing that's come out and seems to be pretty consistent is that when the default mode network is less active, not gone, but more subdued, less active, people describe higher degrees of well-being, quality of life, happiness, whatever word we use to describe elevate, you know, higher well-being is associated with less default mode network activity. So it seems that as we have less default mode network activity, we have higher levels of well-being. And so this, again, has implications in terms of what do we recommend to the public? What can we do on a day-to-day -day basis to support our mental well-being? And so one interpretation from some of these studies is that a quieter brain is a happier brain. And we're going to get a bit more into that as we as we go through this. Also, want to touch about uh, resilience, psychological resilience. So, you know, resilience is basically the ability of an organism or human to adapt to an environment when it faces uh, demanding or stressful situations, or you know, the ability to bounce back from a difficult situation. So, resilience is is certainly a useful. Uh, trait to develop in our lives 
because no matter how good we try to be in our day-to-day -day lives, inevitably life will throw a curveball at us and we must face it as best we can and psychological resilience will, will assist with that. Therefore, one thing that's helpful to know as well is that psychological resilience is a malleable trait. Malleable means able to alter it and change it, improve it, increase it. So certain traits that we all have or born with, we cannot change. I have brown eyes and not much I can do to change that. So that's a trait, a physical trait that will not change. Now, some of us are, you know, depending how we're born or life circumstances, genetics, a whole variety of different factors will put us at different sort of uh, uh, abilities, I suppose, with, with psychological resilience. However, it is not a trait that's set in stone. It's not like if you're, you know, you grow into adulthood and you have a certain amount of psychological resilience at 25, that that's the same amount of psychological resilience you will have your whole life. It can be, it's malleable trait. It can be altered over time uh, if you give the brain what it needs. And so again, a very interesting finding that the, that a decrease in activity of the default mode network is associated with increased psych psychological resilience. A quieter brain is a more resilient brain. Okay, when there's less excessive thinking, we seem able to bounce back from difficult situations a bit more easily. We'll go to the next slide. So the question for you folks watching this today is, have you ever noticed the hamster, the blah, 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 the monkey mind, whatever we want, we want to call it, running around in your mind? Have you observed that that's something you experience in your day to day? Okay. And so you can see here, Snoopy gets a little troubled when he, his mind wanders too much. He gets thinking a little, gets into the stinking thinking a little bit too much and then gets, gets a little down. And so this is something we all share and I don't want to demonize it either. Like this is bad. Thinking is bad. Not at all. Ob obviously there are very, very many practical aspects of, of good, useful thinking. Um, we're talking about the excessive, unnecessary thinking, and it's something that we all share. Too much blah, blah, blah. This is one of the great challenges of our time is for us collectively to notice that happening in our mind and take concrete, practical steps towards modifying that just a little bit. You know, 1% can go a long way. So, you know, again, this is what we're slowly getting at with the mental hygiene. And, and the goal of mental hygiene is, is to address a little bit of this tendency that we all have, which is you know, excessive thinking. And again, to go back to, to the uh, dental hygiene analogy, because I really enjoy using that analogy of dental hygiene. It's a very practical analogy. So we don't have to worry about dental plaque, and we, but it's something that happens to us all. And when it happens in excess, then our teeth are more vulnerable to cavities. So therefore dental hygiene is good. And it's a kind of the same thing with this, the default mode network. We all have it. Um, it's okay. It's very normal for it to, to, to work and do its thing. But when it becomes excessive and, and dominates the brain, then we become vulnerable to mental health issues. Okay. We're going to go to the next slide and talk about a little bit about the task positive network, because it's, it's a bit useful to understand, um, the contrast between this network and the, the default mode network. So the task positive network, again, for those of you who like uh, sort of specific scientific terminology, we're looking at the lateral prefrontal cortex, the, and the posterior parietal cortex, which sort of constitute the main hubs of the task positive network. On the next slide. So the task positive network is also referred to as the central executive network. It's associated with highly, uh, with, with a goal oriented activity. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a focused state. It represents a focused state. So essentially when you're very focused on a task, it could be something simple. It could be something complicated, but say for example, you have to really concentrate on getting uh, a screw you're using your, your electric uh, screwdriver into a difficult spot behind the fridge because you're fixing something and you're really focused. 
you know, it's usually the task positive network that's activated because you're tasking, you're focused on a task. So if we go to the next slide, um, it's an interesting thing to see the contrast between the task positive network and the default mode network. So again, this has been documented quite well that these networks sort of compete for brain activity. They are what we call anti-correlated. As one goes up, the other one goes down. As the other one goes up, the other one goes down. Okay. And so I want uh, those watching here today to kind of think, use their imagination a little bit to, or, or their memory to think back on a moment, maybe it was the last few days, last few weeks, whatever it is, to, um, to remember a moment where you were really focused on something. You were in the zone, you were doing a good job. Let's say it's at work and you're, you're getting a lot of emails done really well. You're just in a good state of mind and you're getting things uh, you know, organized and, and you're just in a good flow. You might observe that during those moments, there's not much blah, blah, blah happening. And then you put in you know, a good morning, you, you were quite focused, you did a lot of stuff. Then you sit down for lunch to have a break and then oh, blah, 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 starts again. So I'm wondering if that relates to anybody's experience listening today. Because essentially when you're doing your task and you're focused on your task, the default mode network shuts down and the task positive network is online. And then when you're finished the task, whoop, it defaults back, default mode network, it defaults back to the default mode network. The blah, blah, blah comes back online. And so this is a little bit about what we want to do today is learn how to activate the task positive network, slow down the default mode network, kind of at will and do it when we want to or when we remember to and not necessarily wait for um, just having an important task that forces us to focus, but learning to create that brain condition, a brain state in very ordinary circumstances. And gently, with a bit of repetition, learning to teach the brain to have less excessive, unnecessary thinking, which is something that I go back to a lot. So we'll go to the next slide. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about mental training, because a lot, there's a lot of discussion sometimes about if mental training in terms of having an impact on the brain is a real thing or not? Is it just sort of a, a fancy fad or a, you know, a trend that's happening and will go away sooner or later? Well, it's pretty clear from a lot of evidence now that it's, the brain can be trained. The brain can modify its patterns if it's trained a certain way, just like a muscle will grow if you exercise it repeatedly, very similar patterns. And so, for example, they've done, um, you know, they, they've taken experienced meditators and people who have meditated a lot, a lot of meditation practice in their lives, and those who haven't. And they've, they, they've compared the brain, uh, the brain images through different methods, EEGs, functional MRI uh, studies, and they noticed that usually the, the experienced meditators will have less default mode network activity um, than, than those that have never meditated before. Also, however, if you take people who have uh, never meditated before, you scan their brains, you put them through a eight week meditation program to teach them and, and do it every day and go through a program for about eight weeks and then you rescan their brains, they often note that the activity of the default mode network has decreased. And so other things, for example, as little six to 12 minutes a day of, of certain types of meditation practice has shown uh, beneficial effects on the brain. And, and so the, the idea of training the brain to produce more healthy cognitive patterns that are conducive to well-being and less suffering is, has been demonstrated and repeatedly. And so we need to start taking this information and creating 
working models and recommendations for the public and for ourselves as individuals in order to empower ourselves to be able to experience uh, an improved mental health in our day-to-day -day lives on a fundamental level, not just kind of a, I feel better for a day or two because something good happened to me, but fundamentally improve our well-being because our internal state is more conducive to well-being. Uh, this gentleman here uh, who had about, you know, he's got more than 30,000 hours of meditation practice, which is, um, you know, quite rare in general. And, you know, he experienced, he, he describes later in, in his life when he was in his late 50s, early 60s or so, that his brain became very, very kind of quiet and, uh, you know, kind of a very peaceful fella that, but very functional, had grandchildren, had a big job, was in the army for a while, kind of a regular guy, but there was very committed to meditation. And then, you know, later in life, his brain became very, very quiet. And they scanned his brain a couple of times with different approaches and, and noticed that his default mode network was, was very kind of qu quite, quite little activity there. Um, so this is not to say we need to strive to do 30,000 hours of meditation. Again, this, is, this, this discussion is not about meditation. It's about mental hygiene. But this is just to demonstrate we don't, you know, we don't need to be Olympic athletes to have a 20-minute walk outside for physical health. But we can be inspired sometimes by those people who really push it to the extreme and show us what's possible. So he kind of, this gentleman just kind of shows, you know, a little bit of what's possible with the brain, um, but certainly not trying to draw a comparison with it. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So again, this is the case for mental hygiene. This is why I'm here. This is why I'm happy to be with you is to talk about mental hygiene. Um, and so it, last year we published a paper in the Journal of Prevention and Health Promotion, uh, reintroducing the concept of mental hygiene. Mental hygiene was a concept that was, util, that was used and, and promoted in the early 20th century, in the early 1900s. And midway through the century, it kind of just sort of died away. And, and, you know, we've, we've brought it back to, to say, hey, like, let's take care of our brains on a day-to-day -day basis, just like we brush our teeth on a day-to-day -day basis, just like we shower on a day-to-day -day basis, just like we try to get a little bit of physical movement for our physical health on a day-to-day -day basis, just like we watch our sleep. We want to apply the same hygienic concept to the mind, to the brain. And so we're calling it mental hygiene. And so the case that we're saying is as modern people, we are generally prone to excessive unnecessary thinking with excessive default mode network activity. A quieter brain we know is equal to a happier brain. And for all the organizations out there, um, it, you know, if we want to be a healthy organization, we must ourselves practice good mental hygiene. You know, it's at, at one point, even if you have the best employer ever, the best organization, the best everything, the best conditions, there's only so far it can take you in terms of your well-being. So it's good to have good working conditions, supportive employers, supportive uh, colleagues. Those are all good things that support our mental well-being. There's no doubt. But you can have the best boss and the best colleagues and the best everything, and your mind is nonstop racing, and you're still kind of experiencing a degree of suffering. And really... The, the, that's where the mental hygiene on a day-to-day -day basis will can address that to a certain degree, but it won't be better conditions on the outside. So uh, organizations can do a lot to support their their troops and their 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 employees, but also health will come from the individual taking care of their brains on a day-to-day -day basis. And mental hygiene is a universal principle. So it's like you know whether is it important for, you know, is it more important for me or for uh, my mother to shower? You know, it's an absurd question. It's important for both of us. Is it more important for her for me to brush her teeth? Again, these are silly questions and that's the point. It's universal. We should all brush our teeth. And we should all shower on a regular basis. And we're saying it's the same thing with mental health, with, sorry, mental hygiene. It's everybody, mental hygiene is for everyone whether it's a high functioning, you know, uh, executive at a big corporation, or it's a schizophrenic struggling with their health. They both need to shower. They both need to brush their teeth. They both need to take care of the mental hygiene. And so we also want to 
start moving away from the idea of tricks and techniques to deal with stress to more embedding it into our lifestyle. So what I mean by that is, for example, and we'll go through some different stuff, is men, like breathing exercises, for example, or, or deep breathing. So if we, if I, for example, I, I go see um, a psychotherapist because I'm going through a stressful time and we, we do the counseling, which is absolutely important for people who need that. I highly recommend counseling if you need it. Um, but they'll give me, for example, some breathing techniques to help me with my stress. And then I'm like, oh, this is great. Okay. So then I go into my life and then I'm feeling a really, I'm really stressed out. And then I do the breathing. It kind of helps me. Eventually my stress subsides and, and settles down. And then I just don't forget about the breathing. Well, we're saying that the breathing in this instance should be done every day. A good day, a bad day, we do the mental hygiene. So I don't shower only when I've fallen in the mud. I shower every day. I don't brush my teeth only when I have cavities. I brush my teeth every day. So the mind is no different. It needs daily maintenance. So you're having a good day, you take care of your mental hygiene. You're having a bad day, you take care of your mental hygiene. Okay, so we want to move away from these techniques as being little tricks you do when you're not feeling good. Obviously, it's good to use them when you're not feeling well. We want to encourage that as well. So when I fall in the mud, I want to shower, <laughs> okay? And if you're stressed out and you can sit down and do some breathing to help you get into a better state, all the power to you, and that's a fantastic thing. But we want to push it a little further and say, these kinds of practices need to become embedded in our day-to-day -day lives and not just wait for the bad day to do something good for our mental health. Okay, so for the next slide. So here's a general list of mental hygiene practices that, um, and we're going to talk about, we've, we've just finished a campaign about mental hygiene called the Mental Hygiene Challenge that, we, that was hosted by the Royal. And uh, it was, went really well. We're really happy with it. So again, I, I used the discussion about meditation before because there's been a lot of studies and brain studies around meditation and things like that. <clears throat> but this is not um, a discussion to promote meditation. This is a discussion to promote mental hygiene. And meditation can be one form of mental hygiene. So if somebody really likes to meditate and, and they do that you know, uh, every day, that's great mental hygiene. That's great. However, there's many other ways based on uh, evidence-based practices that we know support mental health. So uh, we'll go through a few of them in a bit, but like breathing exercises can be helped. Gratitude exercises, uh, journaling, nature exposure, um, uh, guided meditation. We'll, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And uh, we'll share a little bit of a link after in terms of the toolkit that we've built to guide people to all sorts of different practices uh, that can be done to, to support, support mental health. So next slide, please. So we're going to go through a couple of them. Okay. We want to do a couple of practices just to give you a bit of a kind of a introduction, a mini introduction, and, and really, uh, obviously the exploration of it after comes from your, you know, your willingness to check it out and practice and do it on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a mental hygiene Facebook group that's very supports each other. It's a fantastic, fun group online. Um, so th this is just a, a bit of an introduction. So we'll go through uh, a couple of them. So this one we call uh, breathing stillness. And so this is a very simple uh, exercise where we're going to take two breaths together in a moment. And what we're going to do is really focus with as much concentration as we can on the physical sensation of our nostrils as we breathe in and breathe out. Okay. This is a physical thing we're doing. We're going to feel our nostrils as with as much detail as possible as the air goes in and out. And we can also uh, keep some awareness on the feeling of the movement of our belly. So those two things um, is what we're going to do. So really focusing like your life depends on it, like you've been chosen at halftime at a basketball game to shoot a basketball from the free throw line. And if you get it, you get $10,000. You got to focus 
okay? So really bring as much focus as you can to the simple sensation of your nostrils as you breathe. So I want us to all put our feet flat on the ground. We're gonna sit nice and straight, okay? And we're gonna put our hands on our belly. And now just for a moment all together, we're gonna take two deep breaths, really focus on our nostrils and the movement of our belly. Here we go. Okay, so if I can just jump in here, for those of you listening, what did you think about in the last 15 seconds? So when I pull this little trick with people sometimes, many folks will say, oh, I wasn't thinking of anything. I was just feeling my nostrils. Or, you know, not much was going on in my head. Sometimes people have more trouble than others, but overall, in my clinical experience, and working with a lot of folks now over the years, everybody can learn to stop thinking for 15 seconds so if we go back to slide 13 for a moment we look at the default mode network and the task positive network right here. so right here when we took those two focused breaths okay we temporarily stop or reduce the default mode network and activated the task positive network so we went into a focused state temporarily and stopped the blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we're just going to go back to slide 17. So this practice is deceivingly, deceivingly effective. Okay. It's, it seems overly simple to breaths, whatever. Okay. It's kind of like a brain push up. So if, if I ask a friend of mine for some advice about, you know, getting into shape because I want to go to the Cuba a couple of months and I want to look good on the beach, whatever. And they're like, okay, do some push-ups," And I get down, I do one or two push-ups. I'm like, oh, it didn't do much. Eh, it doesn't do much. And the guy, you know, my friend's like, well, you can't just, you know, it's not gonna do anything if you do that, only that many. So if I kind of turn that around and do like, a, you know, a lot of push-ups every day for many weeks, then all of a sudden I get results and I, Get, the muscles get stronger. Same thing for the brain. Uh, so the ability to repeatedly stop thinking, if it only for five, 10 seconds, many times throughout your day, is very effective in terms of improving well being and reducing suffering. So, one recommendation I often give will be throughout your day, during your waking hours, every hour, for, for every hour, take two, three breaths and stop thinking for about, you know, it could be three, four breaths or about 20 seconds. Stop thinking, just focus on your breath for two, three breaths and do it the next hour and the next hour. And maybe use your phone to remind you, it'll give you like a little happy ring. So doing this every hour throughout waking hours. So let's say uh, 12 times a day, 20 seconds at a time. That's about 240 minutes, uh, 240 seconds. Uh, that's about four minutes of your day spread out throughout your day of no thinking very very healthy very good mental hygiene and so what we're trying to do here with mental hygiene is come up with practical practical ways in which we can integrate mental hygiene in our day-to-day -day lives many of you listening i'm sure are very busy lots of responsibilities lots of things to do but you find a time to brush your teeth anyway and we're saying you can find a time to slip in there some mental hygiene and so if you're having a good day stop thinking multiple times a day if you're having a bad day stop thinking multiple times a day just get it done get it in and with time the ability to kind of quiet it down at will and and just have a slightly quieter brain will assist the well-being and psychological resilience we'll go to the next slide so i want to show this one uh you know, some people laugh at me about this one. It's kind of, you know, it's, it, it feels a little strange, but if any, if it resonates with anybody here, I encourage you to explore it. Even if you do three minutes of this over and over and over again, it, it, it's a very practical technique in my experience for people who've never done meditation, who have no experience, who just want to try something out 
to calm their brain, it's really useful in the sense that it, it tricks the brain into a quieter state. So, um, yeah, so it, it really, it, it brings the brain into uh, a slightly more calm state. And even if you've never done this before, it can be very useful. So sometimes like, you know, mindfulness meditation, if we've never done it before and we try it for the first time, so we sit down, we close our eyes, focus, and all of a sudden pff, the brain goes somewhere else. Okay, okay, I was distracted back. Okay, I'm focused. Oh, we're gone again, come back. And it gets almost sometimes frustrating for people who've never done it. Um, well, this little trick here can be a little quick way to just jump right in and, and help the brain get into a, a more calm state without too much difficulty. So uh, it involves finger movements. It's very important because engaging the motor cortex helps to quiet down the default mode network. So we're going to do fingers and we're going to do sounds. Ta, sa, na, ma. Ta, sa, na, ma. And so doing the sounds with the fingers is quite key and critical to this practice. <clears throat> Secondly, we want to have, we do with the eyes closed and we visualize a warm sun that's kind of giving us sort of a, a gentle sun rays that make us feel kind of nice and cozy inside. Um, and so, oh yeah, so one thing I want to just remind everyone is that the sounds are non-symbolic, meaning they don't mean anything. We're not chanting or making sounds that represent anything really. They're sounds. They're basically sounds. Uh, they're actually part of the Sanskrit alphabet. So it could be very similar to saying A, B, C, D. Anyways, but we know from certain studies that certain, if you repeat certain sounds in a certain way, it can help the brain into a calmer state. And this is what it's all about. So I'm going to do a little demo of repeating it three times. And uh, we do have a demo video also in, in our toolkit that we'll have a link for. So for those of you who kind of are piqued, uh, piqued the interest of it, again, try to go for it. Five minutes straight, okay? It feels almost a little awkward at first, but if you just settle into it, you might notice it, it can really be of good assistance. Some people tell me they like to do this in the shower, and it helps them kind of feel a bit more calm if they're a little worried about something. So here we go. Take a deep breath. Ta sa na ma. Ta sa na ma. Ta sa na ma. Ta sa na ma. And here we go. That's that's pretty much it. And if you try to engage this as much as you can and really focus on it, again, it quiets the brain, settles down the default mode network. The excessive, unnecessary thinking, blah, 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 is lessened, okay? This is not about perfection here. This is about aiming for a little bit better, okay? Better is better. And we all want to feel a little bit better. So any, if it's a 1% decrease in the blah, 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 that's a great job. That's really good. If you engage this on a day, you engage your mental hygiene every day, it's a great job to, to reduce uh, the excessive thinking through different practices. And if this helps you, that's great. Okay, next slide, 19. I want to talk about quickly uh, thinking through versus thinking about. This is a critical one for a lot of people. And so a lot of us spend tons of time thinking about something that bothers us. And so we ruminate about it. We, we go back to it. We talk to ourselves about it, <clears throat> okay? We, we, we end up thinking in a circular pattern about the thing that's bothering us. But we're not actually in the part of the brain that is designed to find solutions and solve problems. We're actually in a part of the brain that's not designed to solve. So we just get stuck there and we feel more stress and not actually come up with anything practical for the thing that's bothering us. So again, and just to backtrack for a second, I've shown you the chanting, the breathing. We've talked about a little bit about meditation, things like that, but mental hygiene can also be uh, paper, pa pen and paper exercise. They're excellent mental forms of mental hygiene. It does not have to be kind of more traditional contemplative practices. Pen and paper exercises can be excellent. They can be very good for your brain in terms of supporting mental well-being. Okay, 
back to thinking about versus thinking through. So what this ent ent entails is to take a piece of paper and a pen, write down the thing that's troubling you the most, and really think through it. You think through it. What are the possible solutions to this challenge? You're brainstorming as you think through it. What are the pros and cons of solution A versus solution B? Uh, what are the initial steps I can do to carry out the solution? You brainstorm as best you can uh, through this challenge or through the thing that's bothering you or the problem that you feel you have. And so it's very different to think something through than to think about it. Okay, it's not the same thing. Thinking through does not equal thinking about. So if you go to the slide 20, the next slide, just again to demonstrate here, thinking about generally is worry provoking. It includes mind wandering. It's not solution or focused. It's, and, it, and it's usually just ruminates around the problem without any solutions. And we usually feel distracted when we're worrying about something and we're thinking about it a lot. Thinking through, on the other hand, involves using a different part of the brain, the task positive network. It's you're concentrating on the problem with a piece of paper and a pen. Very difficult to do this without a piece of paper and pen. Highly, highly recommend having a piece of paper and a pen. So you're reflective, you're concentrating, you're solution focused. And actually, even if you don't have the solution, just going through this exercise, you might notice that all of a sudden, because your blah, blah, blah has settled down and you're actually looking at practical ways to deal with this challenge, you're already starting to feel a bit more relaxed. Okay. So remember, thinking through does not equal thinking about. If you're worried about something and thinking about it a lot, time to switch it up. Think through it. Grab a piece of paper and a pen, think through it. And if you think through stuff, because every there's always something every day that bothers us a little bit. If you get into the habit of thinking through something, you know, five minutes a day, every day, uh, and doing a little bit of breathing on top of that, I mean, wow, that's excellent mental hygiene. Okay, so mental hygiene can take on many, many forms. Okay. The next one here on this next slide 21 is coordinating breathing and walking. Okay, because again, we want mental hygiene to be accessible to everybody. Okay, we want it to be uh, something that everybody can do every day. And so something that we all do every day is walking. So sometimes you can walk to your car from your work office and thinking about stuff in your head, how the day went, or you can do a little mental hygiene. So this involves coordinating your steps and your breathing. Again, we have a demo video. Um, takes a little bit of practice to get the hang of it, but it really doesn't take that long to get pretty good at it. So basically, you breathe in for two for three steps and you exhale for four steps. So you breathe in two, three steps, exhale two, three, four steps, inhale two, three, exhale two, three, four steps. Okay. Um, it doesn't need to be the three and four that I've presented here. It can be th four and five. It can be two and three. It can be the same number, although we usually recommend one extra step on the exhale. It seems to provoke a bit more concentration. Um, but this can be done anytime you're walking down the hall to see your boss, uh, on the way to the car, whatever. It's a great way to encourage a quieter mind in very ordinary day-to-day -day circumstances. Okay, and again, uh, if we go back to slide 13, when you're coordinating the breathing and the walking and going to the car, um, you're and really focusing on coordinating your breathing and walking, you're in the task positive network, you're in a quieter state, and the default mode network has settled down a little bit. Okay. So if we go back here, so yeah, that's coordinating breathing and walking. We have a demo video. We have another explanation in the toolkit. Um, this is a great one, accessible to all and, and usually available every day to do. We're going to go to the next one, uh, next slide 22, about gratitude exercises, okay? Um, and I'll just uh, say here that it's, it's such a simple thing that we take for granted, but there's a lot of psychological data about studying people who exercise gratitude. And it's really, really clear that gratitude is good for you. It's very good for mental well-being. So 
learning to exercise gratitude is very good for your mental health. So, so one practice that we encourage is to take a piece of paper and a pen, again, pen and paper exercises, write down three things that you appreciate in your life. So, so that's the, the part where you just, you know, it's in your mind, you write down the three things you appreciate, and then you take, um, and then you take a moment afterwards to actually feel gratitude for the thing that you just wrote down for each one. And then you repeat the next day, three new things every time. And if you challenge yourself to do this for a month, you'll find you've written down 90 things you're grateful for and have taken a moment to feel the appreciation. And that will find yourself, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel more grateful these days, you know? And it's like, did your life really change? No, but the gratitude muscle of your brain has stronger and you've strengthened it. And so the way you perceive your reality has been slightly altered and your mental well-being has elevated due to your excellent mental hygiene. Um, so the recommendation here is that what we've recommended to everybody is to challenge them to do 10 minutes a day. So I want to talk a little bit about on the next slide here, 23, about the mental hygiene challenge hosted by the Royal that we completed in, um, we just finished in March. So it's from March 1st to March 31st. Um, and so we challenged everybody to do 10 minutes a day of mental hygiene on a day-to-day -day basis to support their mental health and well-being. Um, one of the goals was to kind of create a community uh, that to encourage each other to develop healthy, uh, you know, mental hygiene practices, develop habits that are healthy for us, and encourage each other along. So we challenged. So the basic the challenge was to do 10 minutes of mental hygiene a day. In whatever format they wanted so we gave a huge toolkit and said take what you want mix this do that if you want to do a little bit of journaling a little bit of breathing a little bit of coordinating breathing and walking just get your 10 minutes a day you can mix and match it you can find something that works for you individualize it to yourself and we're not saying either by the way that all the practices of mental hygiene are, are are definitive in terms of our list so somebody might have something else they do on a day-to-day -day basis that supports their mental well-being and they do a good job at that well that's a great form of mental hygiene as well so we encouraged everybody uh to join along with that and we had a really great experience it was a lot of fun it was our first mental hygiene awareness campaign in order to go towards the bigger goal of establishing public health recommendations for mental health and calling it mental hygiene and establishing minimum sort of standards of what we should all target in terms of day-to-day -day maintenance and upkeep of our own brains. So if we go to the next slide here, 24, just a couple metrics uh, of what happened. It's We had about 3,000 uh, 3, uh, registered participants, so we were pretty happy with that for our first inaugural mental hygiene challenge this year, the first time doing it. Um, we've, we've managed to get 600 uh, pre challenge surveys. So we're hoping to see, we're going to see what happens in terms of the post challenge surveys and be able to study a bit of the impact of mental hygiene. And we have a very, very active Facebook group and in our mental hygiene kickoff ended up having quite a few views as well. And really the, what's been very rewarding is all the, uh, the testimonials from the participants of, they seem to really, really appreciate it. So that's been really nice. Uh, and so as we wrap up here, this is the link here that um, people can use in order to access all the content that we built for the Mental Hygiene Challenge. It's on the Royals website, so they've been great to give us a, a part of their website to put all these materials for people to access free. It's all for free and to encourage mental hygiene. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, mental hygiene is a lifelong journey. I don't stop at 60 years old and say I'm going to stop brushing my teeth. Um, and I don't stop at 55 and, and say, well, I don't want to need to shower anymore. This is a lifelong journey. Mental hygiene is a lifelong journey. And it's hygiene. Sometimes I can brush my teeth really well and still get a cavity. You know, you can still have great mental hygiene and have mental, hy mental health challenges. It happens. But overall, collectively, if we all individually take care of our mental hygiene, address our brain and mind on a day-to-day -day basis and maintain it as best we can, together, collectively, we'll be a healthier society with improved mental well-being, which will be good for all of us. And so I want to just highlight this gentleman's quote, which is a pretty cool fella. Um, the next slide, 26, is, this is the Dalai Lama, who said, values are related to our emotions. Just as we practice physical hygiene to preserve our physical health, 
we need to observe emotional hygiene to preserve a healthy mind and attitudes. So kind of a similar thing that he said that it models our, our framework. Um, so thank you very much. It's been great to be with you. And uh, I look forward to, to, you know, hoping that everybody here uh, checks out our mental hygiene uh, material and engages in, in mental hygiene in their own day-to-day -day lives. Thank you and have a good day.